you meet man. again. Yes, indeed. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm with two uh, boat riders. Uh, my name is Farfarim. This is Ajana. I know what John is. <laughs> you know Jana, that's great. Um, and we're here actually to talk about the fundraising tour and mm -hmm. we also have um, yeah, a couple of questions that yes. involve the black community. Um, we're going to talk about the fundraising tour in a couple of minutes. Um, but first I would also like to reflect on the last time you were here. You were here for um, the conference and you spoke a lot about um, black empowerment and building our own structures. Um, and a couple of days ago you had the meet and greet. How was that? It went well. It went very well. A lot of new faces. Mm -hmm. I always like to see new faces. Uh, the conscious community has been criticized internationally for speaking to the choir, preaching to the same people over and over again. So whenever I see new faces, in addition to the old ones from visit to visit, it does show me that we're reaching a different segment of the population. So it was good. It's growing. Yes. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, Kruti is also embracing the concept of um, Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. Can you give your explanation or your definition of well, Pan-Africanism, which is the black man's oldest formal ideology, mm -hmm. is basically two tenets. Number one, mm -hmm. that all people of African ancestry constitute one human family. And number two, that we should identify primarily as members of that human family before we identify with any other uh, professional, cultural, religious, or other uh, stigmatization. Uh, we're African first. And we believe that if we practice being African first and see each other as members of the, of the same human family, we would be able to get a lot more things done together. We wouldn't be in a situation that we're in now because our primary internal obstacle towards facing white supremacy is overcoming petty differences that are the result of identifying primarily the superficial labels versus our historical, genetic, and biological identification with the mother continent of Africa. So we're fighting over what religion we should belong to. We're fighting over which ideology we should ascribe to. We're fighting over what we should call ourselves, what we should call each other, what we should call God. But if we just recognize that we're all Africans, and if we put that first, we believe that we could rectify most of our other situations. On top of that, if you look at the condition of Africa, you'll see that Africa struggles because she doesn't have a structured, consistent, and committed level of support from Africans out throughout the diaspora. We're the reason Africa is in the condition she's in because we haven't embraced the obligation to her as the mother continent. And Pan-Africanism, you know, we would argue is the solution to all of our problems and international operational unity of African people worldwide. Something that all other races have anyway. So we would argue that Pan-Africanism is something that should be culturally natural for all of us. You know, because we see it's natural for Chinese, no matter where they are, to identify with each other. Arabs, no matter where they are. Anglo-Saxons, no matter where they are. We're the only people who are limited geographically by where we live. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was conditioned into us by slavery. You know, colonialism. But it's time for us to put it back. So Pan-Africanism, again, is an ideology that sees all African people as members of the same human family. And that we identify primarily as being African before we do. You are here for uh, the fundraising tour. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, for about 10 years now, probably longer, I've entertained the idea of building the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy, mm -hmm. which would be the world's first academy based on the principles of Pan Africanism and African culture for black boys. Mm -hmm. um, the idea made a s came a step closer to fruition. Uh, about six months ago, when I learned of the sale of a historically black college, mm -hmm. St. Paul's in Southern Virginia, went down there and met with the president and toured it and met with the realty company that represents the college, and they gave me permission to use the college's name for the purposes of raising money. Mm -hmm. So on May the 20th, we began a fundraiser to try to raise $5 million, mm -hmm. was our original target. That would have gave us enough money to buy the school, but also rehab the school and also operate the school for about a year or two. Uh, but the funds didn't come in aggressively and then I learned that St. Paul's was going to auction again towards the end of the summer which they did tell me what happened so I reduced the five million dollar campaign which would have gave us everything we needed for a year or two I reduced it to the asking price of the property which was two million mm -hmm. and to date we raised about two hundred and fifty thousand give or take a few thousand dollars uh, so 
we've achieved one eighth of the goal, but we still have seven eighths of the way to go. Um, and I would really like St. Paul's. It would be the perfect place for the school. 137 acres, all the land we need, the dormitories, lecture halls, gymnasium, cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It would be perfect. It's in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by an African American community in Lawrenceville, Virginia. However, um, I was a little disappointed recently because the school denied, according to the realty company, the school denied our request for at least the own agreement. We wanted to give them the $200,000 as a down payment and then arrange to complete our outstanding debt on the remaining $1.8 million within a couple of years or so. But the realty company informed me less than a month ago that the school wasn't interested in at least the own agreement. They want the whole $2 million up front. Uh, the school is still there, hasn't been bought. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, I'm the only serious interested party in buying the school. Mm -hmm. Just last week, while I was in London, the president of the college text messaged me and asked me if I was still interested, and I said I was, but you guys are going to have to give me at least their own agreement. That was a few days ago. So I take that as a positive sign mm -hmm. that maybe he's going to have to go back to the board of trustees and say, listen, he's the only person we got. He's serious. we got to work with him. Not to mention that I found out that we're going to have to spend an additional $1 million rehabbing the campus. So not only do I want $2 million, you have $1 million in damages here that I'm going to have to rectify. So you really need to be working on at least the own agreement. Um, but we're now turning our attention to other places. We're still interested in St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. If something changes, we will entertain the offer. But we're now looking at other schools as well. The other schools I don't name on purpose mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the shenanigans that took place with the St. Paul's fundraiser, I didn't like it. Uh, there was some um, attempts to try to uh, misinform the public to try to reduce the support that I had uh, for the fundraiser. So I've learned that you know being totally transparent isn't always the best thing to do sometimes. I've always been totally transparent with everything that I do, but it's not good because every piece of information I put out to the public someone will take it and try to use it to work against what we're trying to do. Mm, and misuse uh, it. And misuse it. Yeah. We're also considering Africa now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was really impacted by the uh, non-indictment of the grand jury in Ferguson mm -hmm. and the non-indictment of the grand jury in New York. And I begin to wonder whether or not Africa would be a better place to educate our children than America, given the racist climate. And so it's, that was originally my idea to begin with. Originally, I wanted to put FDMG on the continent. I shot away from it because I know how negative a lot of our people are towards Africa. I said, if I put the school in Africa, a lot of parents aren't going to send their children. Mm -hmm. So let me put the first one in the States. Mm -hmm. Okay, That was more so to placate the parents and their Willie Lynn syndromes than it was about being true to what I thought was best. But now... Given the current racial climate of America, black boys are not safe there. Mm. They can be murdered at any second, and the police officer know he will go free. So now we're looking at putting the school in Africa. There was a meeting that took place a couple of days ago in Africa about my school, and it was favorable. Um, and so I'm going to be going over there within the next couple of weeks probably to talk even further with the king, traditional ruler, um, who's looking at giving us some land and finding some more land and really trying to make this a reality. You know, um, other Africans have went to Africa to open schools. This won't be the first, but it will be the first of its kind. Because most schools in Africa or anywhere in the world that serve our children, they really just teach them how to be better participants in the European power structure. My school is teaching our children how to work for themselves, to be totally economic and economically and politically independent and self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. So it won't be the first independent school, you know, created by a repatriate, but it will be the first of its kind created by a repatriate. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's clear. Um, you spoke a lot about black boys and mm -hmm. you wrote a lot about black boys. Um, could you tell us um, what is in your view the biggest challenges that they face in the predominantly white um, educational system, um, which parents also in the Netherlands would relate to? Mm -hmm. Well, the war against black boys um, is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. Whether you're in the Netherlands, whether you're in Canada, whether you're in London, whether you're in America, it's the same. It's no different. Um, the biggest challenge is that they're being educated by white women, mm -hmm. most of whom don't like them and could care less whether they succeeded or not. 
Education is too critical of an undertaking to be left in the hands of someone who is totally, totally disinterested in the ultimate success of that child. Mm -hmm. Our children are literally being educated by the enemies of their people. Insane. No one else would allow it but black folks. Most white kids are taught by white people. Most Chinese kids are taught by Chinese people. But most black kids are taught by white folks. We're the only people who trust someone else, you know, with the education of our children. And that's why we're as backward as we are. Because whenever the enemy, whenever the oppressor, whenever the group in power controls the education of the oppressed, then that education will always be an education that prepares the oppressed to accept the position in society that the group in power has already predetermined that they should have. So as long as white women are responsible for educating black boys, we're going to get more special ed. We're going to get more ADHD. We're going to get more high school dropout. We're going to get more mass incarceration. Because that is the purpose of existence for black men in a European social order. To prepare them to be the raw resource in an ever-increasing mass incarceration in the cartel and complex. But if a child is already in the school system, what would you advise parents to do? How would you guide your children? How would you protect them against well, the system? Well, it's going to be a fight. You can do it, but it's hard. It's going to be a lot of hard work. Um, first thing parents need to do, they need to read my book. It's the first thing they need to do because it teaches you how to protect the child. That's number one. Number two, they need to master the law, the educational code in the country and district where they live. Know the code. The schools don't give you the code. Okay. I'm a school principal as well as a school psychologist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Principals don't tell parents their rights because it makes their job hard. So if you want to know how to protect your child, you've got to master the code. I know the code in America because that's where I live primarily. But now that we're organizing chapters of the National Independent Black Parent Association here in the Netherlands and several chapters over in the United Kingdom, I have to learn the codes of these countries too. So one of the things I'm going to be looking to do is get my hands on the school code, get it translated to English because I don't speak Dutch so I can study it and compare it because a lot of the stuff is the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can be more effective when it's time to do the parent advocacy training over here. But read my book, study the code, join a parent association. We have to start fighting as groups of parents, not individuals. Okay, the same way we should be fighting the European power structure as a whole, we should be fighting the schools in an organized fashion. All four of you could have a son that goes to the same school. Your son is being suspended. Your son is being expelled. Your son is being put on drugs. Your son is being put on special ed. Y'all fighting on your own. But if y'all came together, it would reveal, okay, the collective nature of this problem. This ain't just about my son. It's about the black boys in that school. You see, you automatically change the dynamic of the conversation. You're no longer representing your child and your interests. You're representing all the black boys who go to this school because we have a conglomerate of parents who are at the table. The parents have to be organized. The problem with organizing parents, though, public schools have money and they can buy out the opposition. They do an excellent job of doing it. You're in charge of whatever movement is taking place to change something in the school. They'll offer you a grant. They'll offer you a contract. They'll offer you a job and get you right out the way. They do it in America all the time. Mm -hmm. Who's in charge? Find out what their price is. They would rather pay you than change because the change will cost them a whole lot more money in the long run than it would to simply pay you off. So we have to be resilient. You understand? We have to have psychological hardiness. Remember, school systems oftentimes employ more people than the local government does. You have more people who work for school districts than you have work for government, depending on the population, you see. Mm -hmm. So schools are very, very powerful. So when you talk about coming against the school district, the organized power of white teachers, the organized power of white administration, administration you have to really be organized and you have to be resolved in your commitment to changing because it's a power struggle. And in any power struggle, he who has the most endurance wins. If we can fight the good fight, we can change anything we want. Yet another question? 
No, continue. Okay. <laughs> um, what are some practical tips that you could give parents in the Netherlands? Perhaps you have heard of the character of Black Bee. Mm -hmm. um, what are ways for parents uh, to deal with that and when their child is being confronted with um, yeah, stu such uh, types of racism, mm -hmm. stereotypes? Number one. I don't really like the idea of giving parents the tips. I like the idea of giving the community the tips. Mm -hmm. Because when you give the parents the tips, it reinforces the notion of individualism. Mm. We're not going to win this by individual parents doing their own individual thing. Mm -hmm. It has to be organized. It has to be a community effort. Collective. It has to be collective. Yeah. So the tips for the community as it relates to Black Peak, number one, our children will never understand it if we don't teach them about white supremacy and white racism. You have to start there. Otherwise, it will make no sense to them. You understand? In fact, they may even come to see it as normal if they're not taught mm -hmm. about white supremacy and white racism, which is why I'm working on a book now to teach our children about white supremacy and white racism because black communities across the world are not teaching their children about white supremacy. Our children are not being made to understand why the world works the way that it does, you see. So the first thing is to teach them about white supremacy, white racism. The other thing, too, after you teach them about black Pete, that doesn't eliminate the impact of black Pete. you got to take black Pete away from the child. So if that means no black children go to school during those days, mm -hmm. then that's what it may need to happen. But something needs to happen. If the district doesn't change, parents have to change, okay? On that day, no child goes to school. During that week, no child goes to school. It has to be systematic, though. Everyone has to participate in that. Then you boycott it. But I think that we shouldn't expose our children to that type of condition. Mm -hmm. Year in and year out, it's going to condition into them a servitude complex, an inferiority complex. They have to be taken away. Now, unlike the television or the radio, you can just turn off the TV. You can turn off the radio. Okay, you can't turn off Black Pete, but you can pull your children away from it. That's what we're going to need to do. Maybe gather all the children during Black Pete celebration, put them in a community center or school somewhere, and give them an African history celebration. Okay, have an African Olympics where they compete academically, public speaking, mathematics, science projects. Find an alternative to the Black Pete and 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 uh, normalize it, make it a part of the regular culture. When white folks do Black Pete, this is what we do. We can't stop y'all from doing it, but we're not going to participate or condone. It. That's very clear, um, practical, also how we can um, fight this struggle. Um, do you want to continue? Yeah, um, children get confronted with it a lot at school. You get drawings, you can take it home with school, take it home to your mom. And this starts like weeks before the celebration mm -hmm. of their party. What would you advise parents to do with that? Because I, as a child, I never brought it home. I know I wasn't going to school that day. Mm -hmm. I know my mom didn't like it, so I didn't brought it at home. I know it for myself, but what would you advise, per advise parents to do with that? I think, again, going back to the collective, questions I would have. Number one, have the parents, and if they haven't, we will look to do that with the Parent Association. The policy committee would deal with black people in the schools, because that's a policy issue. Have they been to the school board meeting and have they put in an official request to eliminate or modify the curricular aspects of the Black Pete celebration? You see, first we have to go through the accepted channels. So once we go outside the accepted channels, we can say we've exhausted the entire process allowed to us through the system for dealing with this. Okay, we went to the school board, we went to the director of education. So first we gotta exhaust those channels. Has there been a petition sent to the director of education that includes the signatures of most black parents, you know, in Amsterdam or within the Netherlands? So first I want to make sure we exhausted that process. The petition, okay, getting on the school board agenda, speaking there. You understand? But first, I want to make sure we've exhausted all of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, once we've exhausted all of those things, then we have to look to boycott it. If children don't go to school, we have to look for them not to do the homework, and we need to make it official. A letter goes to the school district. 
We're informing you that the black children of Amsterdam will not be doing homework involved around this. We're going to let the media know. We're going to let, that's another thing, the international media campaign, I think, needs to be intensified. And I think another thing that needs to happen as well, they have to internationalize the black peach struggle. There's a lot of African businesses who do business with the Netherlands. Shell oil is based here. Okay? Have we appealed directly to African heads of state who provide the Netherlands with their natural resources and ask them for potential embargo against this country until the black peach celebration is no longer an act of the state? You can't stop individual white folk from doing it. But you can definitely remove this state approval from the celebration. I think it's time to internationalize the campaign to eliminate black people. I'm not aware of any attempt by anyone here to take this to the UN, to take it to the African nations who do business with the Netherlands. You have to internationalize this. In other words, you have to get Africans outside of the Netherlands to put the pressure on the government here to collapse black people. You but understand? Who are the key persons? <coughs> yeah. And make sure the people you have doing that are people who are seriously interested in the change. You gotta be careful, because in this conscious movement, a lot of people like to be out front to be seen for notoriety. You have to get sincere people. If you, you only get one chance to do this, you will only get one chance to go before the UN, you will only get one chance to go before these African nations. If you put the wrong people out front and they are afraid or they get bought out by white folks or intimidated, the whole movement is done. But it's time to internationalize it. I would do a research campaign, find out every black business, African business that does any business with the Netherlands. We're going to do a letter campaign. We're going to get on the telephone. You understand? I would send a letter to the African Union to make sure that this issue is put on the agenda at the next African Union meeting, whether that's in Ethiopia or where it's going to be next. You understand there's a Pan-African Congress coming up. There's a lot y'all can do internationally to make the celebration of black people a very uncomfortable thing for white folk. Remember, white people only respect three things. Blood, money, and numbers. Forget the blood, we don't make no weapons. You understand? Money, we spend a lot of it. And money, they can lose a lot of it if these African nations embargo them for the celebration. Okay, and numbers. We have to stand together in order to do this. Which is to say, in order to eliminate the Black Peak celebration in the Netherlands, we are first going to have to neutralize the reactionary forces in the black community here who support Black Peak. You're going to have to neutralize that. You know, the major voices, not everyone, but because the first thing white folks do is, okay, they're against it, but we got 50 black folk prominent in the community, pastors teachers who say there's absolutely nothing wrong with this black beat thing. You, you follow what I'm yes, saying? Yes, and that's Indeed. happening that's all the happening. time. Yes. So you're going to have to neutralize that if you, you know. What uh, you see in the news when, when they show a part of a black man's or a black woman's opinion about black people, it's always the opinion of somebody who agrees with it. Mm -hmm. So that's but what see, they... you can overcome that if those individuals are not gatekeepers. If they're just getting anybody off the street, you can combat that. Because you can speak to how the media will find someone to support their position. There's always someone to support it, okay? Mm -hmm. But the majority of blacks, what is their opinion? You, you follow what I'm saying? Yes. And, and, and that's where y'all come from. That is one person they found to be sympathetic to help substantiate their case. But we speak for the black community. And most of our people are not for this. Are all of our people against it? All of no people are against anything, black, white, or purple. Most of our people do not condone this. How do you deal with the gatekeepers then? <clears throat> well, you're going to have to expose them and let the international community know that they do not represent the black community. That's what you're going to have to do with them. They represent the government's line, you see. Which means that you're probably going to have to have a physical demonstration somewhere where people internationally can see that most black folk are not for this. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have an anti-black peak demonstration. And this is before black peak comes around. That's another thing. Don't wait till the holiday come. It seems like all your energy come when the holiday come. That's too late. You do it leading up to it. You understand? You make it a national issue. And so when we watch on CNN, we see a thousand black folk in the Netherlands rallied around anti-black peak. We want to get rid of this holiday. Now we know the gatekeepers are not representing the post of the people. Because we can see, Africa can see, the Caribbean can see. Look at all them black folk. If they was for this, why so many of them are out there?
So that's the importance of public protest because it shows what people really feel on a grassroots level because if they were not against it, they wouldn't have came out. So you can combat that. The biggest thing is getting the attention of the African nations. I need to get that done. And the other thing, too, is neutralizing the elements, which may simply be reactionary bourgeois elements, which may simply be letting people know they do not represent the black community. You, see? you can even do that with petition. Mm -hmm. You know, although these individuals are saying that this is fine, here's a list of everyone who doesn't. And that's another thing. On paper, on paper, you find out exactly how many black folk are living in Amsterdam. Okay, you want to get at least half of them if you can. Signed up, okay? Sure yeah, you, you got, it's going to take legwork, but it's not a difficult thing to do, and I think I need to start now for next year. It's already been brought uh, before the, uh, the UN, okay. because uh, there's a committee that's uh, leading an investigation on okay. Black Beat by Farid Shepard, and she already made a comment, said that it's uh, a throwback to slavery, and they bombarded her with hate mails and everything mm -hmm. because uh, they said she didn't investigate first before uh, she made that comment. But mm -hmm. it's so it's so openly, <laughs> you know? It's out there. It's yeah. out there. Yeah. But still, they, they're, they're fighting her. But we're waiting for the for the result of that investigation. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and on top of that, there were a lot of protests um, this year. And um, it was very violence. Um, the police actually arrested, I think it was about 90 people mm -hmm. or maybe yeah. 100. This year, yeah. this year yeah. happened this year. and um, you see that we fight an enemy that is very powerful and this enemy is now seeing that we are um, uniting actually and um, they are trying to fight us but in a violent way. Um, what demonize. is the best and demonize exactly. What is the best way to approach that? Well, you could take a page out of Dr. King's book, Endurance. You're going to have to do more of it in order to wear it down. You have to show the international community that this is wrong and that the government is even willing to brutalize us for speaking out against it. Mm -hmm. You see, you're going to have to do more of that. Next year it's going to have to be the same thing, but not 90 mm -hmm. people. It's going to have to be all of y'all. Mm -hmm. Because what they'll say is this 90 does not represent the black community. This is a mm -hmm. small group of irritants. Mm -hmm. They have to show that they do represent the black community, which means more y'all need to get out there with them mm -hmm. and take the beatings again and again and again and again. And that, with the international campaign and everything else, will slowly wear it down. It's a, it's a contest of power. Mm -hmm. It's power, period. It ain't about the laws or nothing. Mm -hmm. It's about power. Are we more resolved to get black people done away with than they are to keep it? bottom line and if we know right now that they're more committed to keeping it than we are resolved to getting rid of it we might as well stop everything we're doing they will win mm -hmm. it's a power it's, it's, it's a tug of war yeah but if we're more committed than them we'll win it might take five years it might take ten i think it can be done quicker especially if you get to those african nations and get them the right letters in, on your behalf i know it can be done quicker because now you're talking about their money and i think it's white folks attention like their money because what will happen is the businesses will go to the government and say, you got to cut out black people. I'm losing millions of dollars. I like black people. I like my money more. That's the purpose of the embargoes. And that's another thing, too. Internally, y'all need to find out what businesses here support black people actively. And black folk need to boycott and expose those businesses. And I suspect that a lot of y'all are buying from people who actively put money towards the black people celebration. So we have to look at our own economic behavior. We can't be hypocrites in this. If we really want to eliminate black people, Okay, who's supporting the black beat? We have to go all the way. <laughs> yes, um, well, getting back to um, parenthood, if uh, that's okay. Um, do you think that single parenthood um, brings more challenges for, of for black children? Especially? Without question, it brings more challenges in general, but especially for black children, because it is very difficult to raise black children in a racially hostile society mm -hmm. and when you're the only parent which means you don't have a partner in doing that mm -hmm. it can really tax your psychological resources and that's why single black parents are more prone to depression mm -hmm. single black parents are more prone to alcohol use cigarette smoking more prone to obesity heart disease and medical problems because they don't have they don't get to take a break see when there's two parents if I had enough I could leave him with the mom, take a day to myself. You have enough, you can leave him with the dad, take a day to yourself. But when you are the bottom line, 
when everything is on you, especially when you're raising multiple children. See, that's another thing. Most of our single parents are not just single parents. They are single parents of multiple children. One child, you can manage. Two, it's going to get tough. Three or more, that is a very cumbersome undertaking. And that's why with the uh, Independent Black Parent Association, we're going to have a social support committee mm -hmm. to try to support all the single parents because they're out there and they're hurting, especially when we talk about the single black mom, which is most of single black parents because of the war of black men that sends them to jail or to the cemetery prematurely. Half of all single black mothers in the Western world are dealing with potentially fatal medical problems. So not only is she raising four children, she has heart disease, she has diabetes, she has epilepsy, uh, she has high blood pressure, okay, she's needing a kidney, she's on dialysis, mm -hmm. you see. And a lot of that is coming not just from poor diet and a lack of exercise, but it's coming from the stress of racism and being the only person who can take care of those children. Our parents are hurting, which is why I don't like talking about strategies mm -hmm. on the parent level. That's individualism. If I got five kids, I don't have time to implement none of the strategies Dr. Umar is talking about. I'm barely getting through the day. Yeah. It has to be a community effort that looks out for the parents. But the community is lacking, and that's why the parents are always being made to be the be-all and end-all for everything. And it's not fair. They get blamed for everything. If the kids ain't learning, it's the parents. It's the parents. It's, the, it's not the parents. It's the community. Where is the community? Why do we never hold the black church accountable? What about the churches? Most of the teachers go to churches. Where's the... uh? Mentorship programs. Where's the reading programs for the struggling kids? Where the math program? Churches don't have no responsibility. What about black businesses? They have no responsibility. What about the so-called black grassroots revolutionary organizations? They're not doing nothing but being social groupies on social network. Mm -hmm. You see, who's helping the parents raise their children? I don't see too many people. About that um, committee, where can uh, parents find more information? Is it on your website? Um, it will be. Okay. They can get it at a couple places. Number one, they need to go to drumarhbcutours.com and register their email address mm -hmm. so they can get regular updates. Mm -hmm. um, also, if they sign up at any of the events that I do anywhere in the world, they'll be added to an email list for their particular city's parent association. Mm -hmm. They can also reach out to me on WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, drumarjohnson.com. Very easy to reach me you know, if, if they want to get involved and have their email added in. But 2015, I'm really focusing on uh, building the school mm -hmm. and also building the parent association so we can protect the children until we have the school. You know, I really had to do a lot of reflection in 2014 about the direction of my career. Mm -hmm. In America, I'm very popular, okay? So people often call on me to do events because they know I'll sell out an event. Because I'm very popular, because I'm very serious, okay? And because of that, a lot of times people call on me, not because they value the message, not because they value the movement or the mission. They just want to sell tickets and get paid off of my name, and I'm getting tired of being prostituted. Yeah. So in 2015, I'm looking to do a lot more things on my own, okay, to maximize what I'm bringing to the table, because I'm not getting no younger at 40 years old. I just don't want to be another scholar who ran his mouth for 20 years but didn't build anything. You know, so in the new year, I'm going to cut down on the uh, lectures and um, I'm going to still do them, but I won't be doing as many because I need free time to do other things like the Black College Tour, like go to Africa. If I'm all booked up, how do I go to Africa and start laying the groundwork for the school? So I got to block out blocks on my schedule where I can't do no lectures for nobody and just focus. I got to get used to it though because I'm so used to speaking four or five times a week and I'm also conscious of the fact that a lot of people need to feel my energy. They need the information that I bring which is more than just history and conspiracy theory. You know, I teach people how to help their children and sometimes that get lost in the sauce, you know, because people often talk about individuals who, you know, give information. I'm more than an information giver. I'm a doctor of psychology. I can help people with their personal problems, with their children. I'm an educator. I'm not just another conscious personality. I come very well experienced, very well credentialed, and I got a heart that will bleed for my people. So I say all that to say that in 2015, I look to intensify the different programs and institutions that I'm trying to build to help our young people. I'm all about the youth.
because yes. I know they're the future. And building their foundation. Which is a contradiction in our community mm -hmm. because most organizations have almost no youth in them. Most black organizations globally have very little folks involved under the age of 21. Very few. And our larger organizations have almost, have almost no youth, which is a big contradiction because if you're organized to help black folk and you don't have any youth, you're not passing down this struggle you claim to be about to the next generation. It's the biggest contradiction we have. The average black organization has almost no youth in it. So how can you really be about black folk with no youth in it? And then the other big contradiction we have is we don't have a process and protocol to transfer power and authority and leadership from one generation to the next. Most of our organizations, a lot of the traditional ones are being ran by people who should have been retired by now. They're still out front, totally ineffective, not doing anything to improve nothing for black folk, mm -hmm. but their ego gets in the way. Because they love being out front, they love being the one everybody sees. You know, and that blackmail castrated ego is a big hindrance to the improvement of our people. Big hindrance. Most mm -hmm. black organizations are ran on a Eurocentric, dictatorial, monolithic culture with one man in charge who dictates what everybody does and if you don't do what he tell you to do, you get kicked out the group no matter how many years of service. You know, most of our organizations have people in leadership because people like them, not because they do the work. I mean, there needs to be a serious analysis of the structure and process and culture of black revolutionary organizations. That's why black people don't join groups. That's why they don't join. They say, I can't join that organization. You got a dictator in charge. Okay, I got to appease him. I got to be about him more than the movement. Okay, if I'm a hard worker, I don't get promoted to be able to really influence things here. The people in charge are the people who he likes or she likes. I mean, we really have to stop blaming the people for why they don't get involved in the organization mm -hmm. and look at the organizational culture. Black organizations are failing because the organizations are not what they need to be. Why waste your time? And be critical about it. Okay. Um, tonight you also have the question and answer uh, session about hidden colors. Um, people yeah. can still register and uh, come yes. up and also contribute. Black Legacy NL.com. Indeed, we're going to show the hidden colors. The Q and A won't be about hidden colors, though. The Q and A will be about issues that are important for Black folk. Mm -hmm. um, not that. Um, you know, so they'll be able to ask any questions, put ideas out. It'll be more of a think tank. You know than um, a Q and A about hidden colors. I mean, people can watch that; they can discuss it. It's an excellent documentary, but uh, we're going to discuss more than that. We have to get work done. Documentaries don't solve problems; people solve problems. So exactly. that's what we want to talk about. Okay. So what, to come to an ending, what would you like to say to the Black young community in the Netherlands? Uh, what would I like to say? I would like to say that they need to get organized, especially the youth. Um, in 2015, I'm looking to really reinitiate uh, the Teen Pan African movement, and I'm looking to do it with youth. I think I'm going to stick to those under the age of 25 to start the movement because most of us above the age of 25, we're kind of set in our ways. We don't really want to change. We like the cultural aesthetics of revolution, but we really don't want to be involved in no revolution once you really understand what it entails. So I think I'm going to start focusing on the youth, starting youth chapters of uh, Teen Pan African all around the world. And um, I want to have one here. Okay, I may have individuals work with the youth who are older than 25, but I want the organization to be ran by those under 25. Get them in a culture of of, of progress and uplift. Um, but all I like to say is, you know, I want everybody to think about coming to Africa with me in July. We're going to Africa, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, and uh, Ghana. We did a tour last year, powerful. One of the thing about Can coming they also there. find the, the information on your website? Uh, the information will be on the website, drumarjohnson.com. Okay. Uh, but I also want to make sure they can get the information directly. Mm -hmm. And that is you can uh, keep communicate with me on WhatsApp uh, through text by my phone, 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. Twitter and Instagram, Dr. Umar Johnson. Mm -hmm. Facebook, Dr. Umar Ifatunde, I-F-A. T U N D E in any of the three websites, Dr. Umar Johnson School dot com, Dr. Umar Johnson dot com and Dr. Umar HBCU Tours dot com. Great. Well, let's round up. Thank you so much for your time and giving uh, this advice to the black community and uh, we can especially learn from that and also implement that and uh, hopefully uh, prosper. Thank you. Yeah.
Umar, I love you. Well, unapologetically African. That's the movement. You got, you're selling this? Uh, yeah. I don't know if I got your size though. I don't, I don't care. I wear your size. Definitely. We get you one this evening.